It's no secret that humans are the most intelligent organism on the planet that we know of. The number of processes that you use to get through your day and that ultimately led you to watching and understanding this video involves significantly more intelligence than any other animal on Earth is capable of. And it's clear to us that intelligence can be an evolutionarily favorable trait. That's why we've seen it evolve to certain extents in so many species. But I think it's fair to say that there is a huge gap between human intelligence and the next smartest animals. Because while they're capable of so much more than we know of and regularly impress us with that, they don't they don't create feature films, or catch Pokemon, or go to space, or stress out about their schooling. They don't stay up till 3am working on videos. <laughs> so while we see selective pressures promoting intelligence as an adaptation, it isn't very clear why our level of intelligence evolved. In fact, this is an issue that many scientists have identified. We are virtually the same animals that existed as hunter-gatherers for millions of years, so why would our brains develop the ability to handle so much more information than is needed for that? It could even be seen as wasteful to put our limited resources into intelligence, especially in the scarce world of our ancestral environment. So today, I'm gonna go through the leading theories on how humans evolved intelligence, but before we get into the theories, I just want to talk about what exactly intelligence is. It's one of those things that science can't come to an agreement on. People disagree on where it begins, how it should be quantified, and how we should measure it. In psychology, we generally accept that there are multiple kinds of intelligence, and that general models like IQ aren't the best measure for it. That's a whole nother discussion in itself, though. In this video, I'm gonna go with the general consensus of intelligence being the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. I'll also refer to cognitive ability as a marker for it. Okay, now, theory number one, the social brain hypothesis. Anthropologist Robin Dunbar believed that human intelligence did not evolve primarily for solving ecological problems. Instead, that living in large groups involved complex behaviors that demanded intelligence. For example, it's useful to have a strong theory of mind, the ability to understand understand the thoughts and emotions of others. Other important group behaviors involve reciprocal altruism, deception, and coalition formation. These are all very complex behaviors worth discussing on their own, but there are also many more because social behavior is really complicated. The idea of the social brain hypothesis is that all of these complex behaviors together, combined with the increased sizes of social groups, was a huge selective pressure, skyrocketing the adaptation of our intelligence. Dunbar proposed that this is why humans have an upper limit to their social circles of 150 people. This is now known as Dunbar's number, and it's the optimal size for effective functionality while still being small enough to maintain a sense of community. There is some criticism to the whole theory though. For one, animals like meerkats have an extensive number of social relationships, but have smaller brains and are generally seen as less intelligent animals. This would go against the idea that increased sociality would mean more intelligence. Also, Dunbar's number has been contested as other researchers propose that the upper limit of human social circles can actually be much higher. So while this is one of the most popular theories on intelligence evolution, it might only scratch the surface about what's going on. Hence, so many other theories. Theories like the cultural intelligence hypothesis, which claims that intelligence increased from generations of cultural information passed down via social learning, where it eventually built up into vast amounts of knowledge and skills throughout the human race. This is supported from the fact that more social learning in a species generally correlates with higher cognitive ability. When looking at two orangutan species, the more social Sumatrans and the less sociable Borneans, scientists found that the Sumatrans consistently performed better in all cognitive tests. But what makes humans so smart is our strong social learning capabilities from infancy. We see babies able to make imitations, learn from observations, and follow the instructions of explicit teaching as well. Some even extend this theory to say our physical cognition is no greater than our primate relatives. Instead, it is only our social cognition that is significant and in turn helps to develop our physical cognition. This is called the transformative cultural intelligence hypothesis, and it's backed from studies that show that the way a teaching is presented to a child significantly impacts their ability to learn from it. Researchers had young children watch this video, which teaches them how to retrieve an object using water. Some kids were told to watch it incidentally, so an adult would say, 
Oh, is this a video? Let's watch it. Others were told to watch it pedagogically, or with the intention to learn. Something like, look Sam, I want to show you something. Children in the pedagogical conditions were able to learn from the video quite well, whereas children in the incidental one didn't perform any better than those who didn't watch the video at all. Showing the importance of adults guiding children to learn and its relation to their actual ability to learn. It's like without the social learning element, no learning could be done at all. Theory number three is sexual selection. This theory like others, posits that intelligence was not required at an abstract level for simple hunter-gatherers. Instead, that intelligence is a fitness indicator, so smarter humans tended to be better mates and sire better offspring, ultimately making them more attractive. This is similar to other big displays that attract mates and animals, also resulting from sexual selection. In the case of human intelligence, it may have been a fisherian runaway. Runaway selection involves the genes of an attractive trait, usually in males, and the genes that make females attracted to that trait becoming correlated. This continues to act as a pressure for the best version of that trait to be formed, which can often lead to exaggerated features like this bird's really long tail. The idea is, is that this happened with humans, but instead of tail length, it was intelligence, and it probably went both ways. Some criticize sexual selection theories of intelligence, because generally, relevant traits for sexual selection only develop around puberty, but human intelligence starts improving from birth, possibly signaling that it's not related to sexual selection. Okay, these next two are pretty quick. We got theory number four, group selection. When living in groups, individuals can specialize. We don't need everyone to be a doctor or everyone to be a chef. Instead, we can just have a local doctor and a local chef to deal with medicine and food. That means in big groups, intelligent specializations can benefit the entire group so long as everyone works together. So even if a massive amount of dedication towards cognition gets in the way of other survival problems, other people in the group can deal with that. This kind of allows intelligence to freely evolve and get better, which in turn provides useful benefits in terms of communication, teaching, and other cooperative aspects. Social exchange theory is similar in that big groups help facilitate greater intelligence, but not because intelligence helps the group, rather that it helps us spot people who are trying to exploit the group. In game theory terms, this would be described as the detection of cheaters. In groups, you have to exchange resources and make agreements, and as we've seen through history as well as personal experience, animals like to exploit these systems in favor of themselves. Under social exchange theory, intelligence is a mechanism of preventing this. And so by spotting cheaters, so that we can punish them as a group, intelligence is required in greater degrees and thus evolves because of it. Theory number six is the ecological dominance social competition model, which states that human intelligence was originally selected for in order to help us control our natural environment. But once we became ecologically dominant, dominant, and freed ourselves from the traditional hostile forces of nature, humans became their own hostile force. That means that social relationships became the new selective pressure, much like the social brain hypothesis. Except with this model, intelligence continues to evolve in order to continue striving for ecological dominance in our new socialized ecology. This means that social competition and cooperation end up driving selection behind intelligence, leading to a social arms race that humans compete with each other in. The literature in this model also states that intelligence likely co-evolved with several other human-specific traits that all have the underlying purpose of improving social dominance. Things like concealed ovulation, extensive biparental care, lengthy childhoods, and menopause, to name a few. I don't have time to get into the evolutionary reasoning behind all these traits, but the EDSC model argues that they resulted from our striving to socially outmaneuver other humans. Okay, so last up, theory number seven. This one is highly speculative but it's actually a really cool idea, and that is the stoned ape theory. The stoned ape theory was first proposed by ethnobotanist Terence McKenna in his book Food for the Gods. It posits that humans came across psychedelics in our transition from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, which expanded the confines of our neuroscience, leading to a cognitive revolution. The idea is that Psilocybe cubensis, probably the most well-known type of magic mushroom, would have grown on cow poop that older humans would have encountered so they would have surely come across them and ate them, leading to greater intelligence. McKenna claims that doses of psilocybin improved hunting skills, libido, attention,
attention, energy, and social bonding, and that even higher levels of intake would trigger activity in the language-forming region of the brain, leading to visions and music, complex language, and even religion. With my own personal experience with psychedelics, I can see why this is a semi-popular theory. Every time I've been on shrooms, I've had some kind of enlightening thought, and I end up just learning a lot about myself. But as we know, evolution works on populations. It happens after generations of change, not because of changes to one specific individual. It's because of this that the stoned ape theory is generally not accepted by the greater scientific community, because there are groups like the Aztecs and Amazonian tribes that have regularly used psychedelics but don't show any evolutionary advantages because of it. Also, it's been argued that a lot of McKenna's work on the theory involves misrepresenting older studies to support it. So there will definitely be a lot more work needed to be done in order to validate this theory. It is a really cool idea though. Okay, so those are seven theories on how the human brain evolved greater intelligence. But this is obviously a super complex topic that I have barely scratched the surface of. I didn't even get into how our forward-facing eyes, opposable thumbs, and a genetic mutation that caused our jaws to shrink all contributed to the evolution of intelligence. There's also a lot to discuss in regards to the consequences of our intelligence. Things like increased brain size causing babies' heads to be too large for natural pregnancies. Seriously, it's all really cool stuff, and I could make many, many more videos on this subject. For now, I've outlined the popular theories, which, by the way, probably aren't mutually exclusive, and at least some of them are all partially true. It's also possible that something else is responsible for our intelligence. We just don't know. We might be the most intelligent species on the planet, but we have no idea how we became that. For now, let me know what you think our pathway to intelligence was. And since you're so intelligent, you should subscribe. It would be a smart thing to do to stay tuned for whenever I make a new video. Thank you guys so much for 10,000 subscribers, by the way. It's seriously like a dream come true. I really appreciate it. I'll keep it up. Uh, I hope you all have a good time until my next video.